Welcome to today's session of Learning with Leaders. It is a very special session. It's the first time where we introduce a panel discussion with three additional participants. We will be talking about what can we learn from failure and how can virtual reality and artificial intelligence contribute to reduce the cost of failure. Today with me, I have the very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Anke Diel. She is CTO of the University Clinics in Essen, my hometown, by the way. I'm also introducing Dr. Kurosh Barami. He is uh, a divisional head of Henkel Adhesive Technologies. And we have the CEO of Doop, who is hosting the virtual part of today's event. Please listen in very carefully. It's a very special edition of Learning with Leaders. Have fun. Hello, welcome to Learning with Leaders today with a very special Learning with Leaders. I have three guests, three panelists today with me. Uh, Dr. Anke Diel, she is CTO of the University Clinics in Essen. Uh, so all, we are almost neighbors. Kurosh, he is Senior Vice President with Henkel Adhesive Technologies. And Vladimir, he is a CEO of Doop. And Doop will be also in the virtual environment, our hosting environment later. So welcome again. Good. So um, our topics today will be around, we'll be discussing around failure, how to learn from failure, and how failure can also have an impact in the virtual world. So let me very traditionally start with Anke with my first question. Anke, um, why in a clinical or medical environment is failure and accepting that failure is part of the process so important? Well, for a start, I must say that, uh, of course, in, in this overall session, you know, uh, I would like to answer with respect to my uh, function as head of the Digital Transformation Unit and not with respect to my function as a medical doctor, because um, in medicine, of course, you know, it must always be the patient first and uh, the patient must be safe and care uh, must be facilitated and given. Um, so, you know, when it comes to digital transformation, of course, it's the same in all industries. Uh, failure is something so important because you learn from it. You know, you, you can actually get very broad insights into your organizational structure, your team structure, uh, technical things, future aspects, you know. So as long as you learn from it, and I think that is the most important factor from it all, you know, um, you're fine with failure. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, Vladimir, um, you are, let's say, representing uh, the, the virtual uh, world. We will be conducting the interview later, uh, the conversation later. And um, so it, have you perceived so far a difference when, you know, having to digest failures in the real world versus the virtual world? What, what is your, uh, your approach to that? You're on mute, <laughs> Vladimir. <laughs> I didn't uh, want to have uh, background sounds for Anke while she was talking. Um, so, um, yeah, real world and, and virtual world, um, you know, both failures are important for our organization. And um, in the real world, uh, it really doesn't matter in our structure who failed. It really matters what was the failure and how the organization can learn out of it. In a virtual world, uh, is a bit different because try and error is try of, uh, is part of the process. So it's really part of the program. Um, and why are you combining different technologies like you know XR computing platforms, um, blockchain, or uh, artificial intelligence? Um, a part of the process is to fail, and uh, then you know what we learn out of the failure why we test certain things how they run and how they you know being harmonized to run in a in a certain way for an experience of the users so it means it's even more important to fail to learn 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vladimir. Kurs, um, you are working in an industrial uh, company. Uh, you're a lot. Uh, you have a lot to do with uh, adhesives, which is a very technical product. So I can imagine that you know failure also in your organization and how to approach it is a very important aspect of of daily business life. What what is your view on that? Yeah, I connect very much uh, what uh, to what uh, Vladimir and Anke were both saying for their areas. Think of innovation, right? You take adhesives in for a medical device in the real world. So you want to be sure that the adhesives is 100% reliable uh, when you have a medical device uh, uh, for any type of surgery, right? However, thinking of innovation in a more disruptive context. So a context, for instance, when we are now making our adhesives data enabled, right? We're adding to the equation IoT, going more to the digital world that Vladimir was referring to. Suddenly we are in a, a field where we don't know actually what the solution will look like. Whereas in the uh, real world adhesives, uh, we exactly know all the tests we would run to make sure it is safe, like uh, any medicine uh, that uh, Anke would uh, produce, right? So now in this disruptive world of real innovation that has nothing to do uh, with uh, our normal adhesives, failure is part of the program, right? And this is exactly what Vladimir was saying. And I think you need very different kind of leadership for running the core versus running uh, re really disruptive e uh, innovation. And this is uh, something that we see in the today's world with WUCA environment. You need to be capable to run uh, in both worlds. And I, what I try to do with my P uh, team is to put people first, right? People first in a uh, leadership is the answer we are trying to give to uh, lead with the core, but also lead uh, in a culture of insights from failure. Mm -hmm. So, um, Vladimir, you, you mentioned before um, that failure is part of the process at least at least in the virtual world but also in in the normal business life as much i would like to let's say believe you um my up to now business experience has also shown me in a lot of cases that failure unfortunately is also very often associated with people with specific people with the people who failed so, um, I mean, in preparation to this discussion, I've seen a lot of articles and videos where, you know, we need it suggested to celebrate failure. Honestly, uh, with all the will in, in the world, um, it's it's wishful thinking still for me. So why, Anke, um, I mean, but of course, I mean, in the discussion, you can also comment to whatever Anke will say. Um, why is it still so difficult, although we all know that failure is key to innovate and failure is part of the process to dissociate it from people? Anke, would you like to answer or anybody else? Sorry, I thought that, that you'd addressed uh, Vladimir. Um... I think you have to cut it out and and then and ask the question again because I was I was listening to, uh, I was looking at Vladimir the whole time. <laughs> okay, wh what is he going to answer and where will I be able to fit in? So sorry. Okay, no problem. Yeah, perhaps perhaps I I tie in. So I think um, Paco, what Vladimir already said that we need to the reward is the insight, right? Mm. So I think uh, we were all educated in our normal school world. You are actually appreciated by success. Mm. Whereas in a more disruptive environment of innovation, you actually should reward for insight. And then the insight is actually uh, 
you know, not related to the person, whereas the success always is related to a person. Mm. Right. So and I think this is part of the equation. We need to, to find an answer together. Right. How can we actually also change our whole school system that is not only you are rewarded for the outcome success, but you are also rewarded for the outcome insight driven by trial and error, driven by failure. And that's a totally different way of uh, I come back to leadership, but also institutionalizing the whole story in our culture. And I think here digital can be a big uh, uh, catalyst, a big accelerator to get to that uh, new culture. Yeah, yeah. Be beautiful thought. Anke, would you like to add something? Yes, uh, I think, you know, when it comes to failure, uh, most people actually point at the resources that you um, invested and kind of say, well, you know, that is too costly, you know, it's too time consuming. And so what is your result now that you failed with that sort of approach? But they don't see the overall assets that you gain from it, you know, the, the market insights, um, uh, the checking of availability of things or future trends, um, as well as your whole team, you know, uh, like especially also for technical things, it's as someone I think Flamia pointed out, you know, it's very much trial and error. And um, uh, yeah, if, uh, that uh, I think people, especially in Germany, you know, in, in our culture, um, it's uh, kind of not um, likely to focus on that. And we should be more self-confident and actually focus on it, on it and say, well, we gained this whole experience and we gained so many valuable insights from it and not so much how we've wasted time and money sort of thing. Yes, definitely. So um, um, I've I've also noticed that the approach to failure is also different from. I mean, you mentioned it, culture to culture. So I mean, the typical example is American versus, for example, German. Um, that German people are more failure averse. That U.S. people have a let's say more healthy approach to uh, to failure but what about difference um, between gender um, let's stay in the classical comparison here in our discussion men and women have you noticed have you have you observed in your business environments a different approach to failure between women and men whoever wants to to comment well, um, as I'm the only woman now in this uh, discussion, you know, maybe I should comment on that first. Um, it shouldn't be a factor, but uh, I think especially when it comes to technology aspects and IT things, you know, um, I feel much more prone to being criticized as a woman because um, it's such a male dominated area with 95% of um, male, um, well, people that actually work in IT, and in other mint subject and um, so you're kind of the odd one out and if you're the odd one out of course you know if, uh, people also look at you differently um, when it comes to digital medicine though it's it's actually a success factor because we've learned that in the way for instance we communicate with our patients those soft skills that uh, women are generally speaking and that has been proven by um, so, so logical uh, research as well um, that that women are actually very good at um, that that is a major factor you know for success so it's not that much you know from uh, whether you can program things or not you know um, mm. but these soft skills that can't be replaced by AI for instance uh, we're very strong at so yeah yeah, thank you. Vladimir Kourosh. Yeah, perhaps I build on that. You know, I think you're asking a very relevant question, uh, Paco, and uh, what Anka said is helpful. I would try even to uh, say, you know, the benefit of diversity you only get when you have the inclusion piece. And the same is true uh, when we talk about the benefits of insights through failure, right? 
You only really get the advantage if you have an inclusive organization that actually is able to get that those learnings and translate it into an improvement. Now in digital, the algorithm is doing this job uh, on our behalf, right? But I, in my organization, we have a thousand salespeople. Now, what I would love to, to see is that every customer interaction that we have, we have 230,000 cust customer visits per year. So roughly three uh, per uh, sa a salesperson per day, this translates. And if you then basically say, what are the learnings they have, especially also not only when they are successful at fail, and how can we scale that? You need that inclusiveness of the organization, both from a, a empathy piece, but also from a very hardware data processing piece, so that you can really scale the benefits of failure, right? Otherwise, you, you just have the frustration piece of failure. Yes. Uh, definitely. So, uh, but there is, I mean, also we're talking, yes, we need to analyze the failures we have done in order to learn for the future. If I remember, you know, it was extremely difficult to carve out that time from the very heavy normal work day uh, because there are a lot of opportunity costs as well. Because when I'm as a salesperson, Kurosh, on analyzing a failure, I can't go to a client visit. So there is still a balance to find there. Uh, so how does that translate in reality if, you know, debriefing on failure and learn from it? Did you give me any thought on that? Um, so maybe, you know, if we if we again compare it to the to the digital world um, as, you know, our organization um, targets all processes really digital, especially in the virtual world, as we are simulating reality and, um, you know, approach of uh, failure or learning in a in a uh, virtual world is different because you are in a simulation. So those costs you mentioned, Paco, are not as high as in reality because we can simulate situations and see what would be the effect. And, uh, you know, uh, we already do it in teams. So if we got a sprinting team finishing a task and, you know, on the way there was trial and error, we analyzed the failures. So in the team already, those points are discussed and then publicly um, uh, open in, for example, Jira for the rest of the colleagues or the teams working in those projects. So we try to directly communicate, don't lose time or don't lose the effort we invested in finding that out. Mm. Okay, let me build on, on what Vladimir just said. And um, uh, although you specified in the beginning, in the intro, that you are here not as a as a medical doctor, but in your function as CTO, um, what I you know can find as a as a challenge is that probably in your team, Anke, in your organization, you are much more open to failure than your colleagues on in the hospital itself. Um, so. Is, is there a culture clash um, b between those two organizations? How do you handle that? Well, I think that's actually one of the success factors for us in, in Essen, because traditionally medicine works in a strict hierarchy and it's also for a closed shop, basically, you know. And whereas uh, you, you can only integrate innovative ideas ideas if you learn about them you know and if you allow them to be spoken out aloud you know so um actually at the university medicine in essen we form interdisciplinary teams because we strongly believe in this idea of the collective genius you know whereas you are not alone uh, a fabulous person and you solve a certain thing um, but, you know, everyone, regardless of whether you're a scientist, whether you're a medical doctor, whether you're nursing staff, therapeutical staff or IT specialist, you know, you mm. must come together, you must sit together and discuss ideas and you must find that time. So, well, basically, 
Corona is um, a, a very good representation of what in the normal industry we learned as um, this volatile, very um, fast changing environment, you know, which brings brings in risks that we hadn't seen beforehand. But on the other hand, in, in medicine, we are prepared for action because as medical doctors, we are trained straight away that you must do triage, you know, you must look at the patient, you must act. Mm. Uh, and uh, from, from my aspect, you know, from, uh, in, in Essen, uh, we have really profited from that situation because we're prone to act. And that in a VUCA environment is very important, you know, that you're flexible, that you react, uh, that you communicate about things, that you do risk control, you yeah. know. So, if, um, yeah, if, uh, it's, it ha certainly, you know, it hasn't hit us the way it could have hit us. Mm. Um, uh, I would like before we, yes, Vladimir. Uh, Paco, maybe just uh, to change the perspective uh, to a view of an entrepreneur, uh, taking a risk is part of your daily life because especially if you are founding a startup, um, you know, and uh, my, 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 my co-founders and me, we always kind of, you know, compared it to jumping out of a plane without a parachute, um, you know, because uh, you are full in. Uh, at that moment, and uh, that fun, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> and then uh, you are you are you are you are you are falling, and um, let's say if you run out of cash, uh, a business angel you grab is is your parachute at that moment. But sometimes, why are you flying down with a business angel in your hand? You look at him and you say, "Oh, this is a business devil," and you leave him and 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 fall again, you know. And being in such situation which brings you you know, into, you know, if you've got family, even uh, economical uh, uh, possible issues, uh, risk and failure are very close together. And uh, at one point you mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, Paco, where you said in the US and in Germany to fail is different. Um, again, if you fail as an entrepreneur in, in the US, um, this is um, something like your experience. You are an experienced founder. In Germany, is kind of negative. You know, if you talk about, um, I had a company, but, you know, it, it crashed. Mm. So what? Uh, that's part of life. And uh, But people look at you different. Even if you hear successful, ah, you already crashed the company. So, you know, something is wrong with that. Yeah, Vladimir, I think it resonates a lot what you're saying with me. You know, I also was two times in my life an entrepreneur. And, you know, now being with Henkel, obviously you can imagine uh, adhesives. We're having 100 years of adhesives. So and we are uh, having uh, millions of these adhesive bottles. You see in my background, we're selling every year. So the culture has to be a culture that you don't fail. Because it can be very serious it's a, if a car uh, is built out of yep. adhesives and then crashes or an airplane even. However, and this is the big challenge, is how can you distill in the organization this additional culture where we all know we need to grow beyond the core. We need to go into new uh, uh, areas, being it for us, we call it Loctite Pulse. So it becomes, you know, you can... Now, since the pulse uh, of the adhesives that you bonded with, and I think this this is really requiring an inclusive leadership environment. Uh, so, uh, and I, I underline this inclusiveness because also the inclusiveness is not only about success and failure. It's also about, you know, allowing digital, especially as a catalyst, being inclusive enough to the opportunities the metaverse uh, is offering us, right, to simulate test things and learn. And I think this will help us. Uh, so my experience with the uh, team that you actually start creating a better culture of learning from failure in addition to the existing one, right? So I hope uh, with that we can build parachutes uh, that make you for sure yeah. safe in any case. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much uh, for this uh, first, uh, I think, very engaging uh, discussion.
Um, see you in a few moments. Okay, welcome back in the virtual world. Um, amazing. Uh, so uh, let's continue here in this virtual environment, which has been uh, produced and um, arranged by Dupe. Uh, so, Vladimir, would you like to very quickly for our audience and our viewers explain what has happened here? Why? Let's say, are we here with our avatars? Uh, what are the preconditions to be here together all with our personal avatars? Yeah, so um, just uh, let me uh, tell you, uh, you guys look uh, fabulous as avatars, uh, really looking good. So um, yeah, being in a, such a virtual space is, um, uh, this space is used as as an event space of one of our clients. Uh, where we at right now? We are in the clouds and uh, we are using um, virtual machines to control our avatar. We are streaming the data onto our devices, which enables us to be anywhere in the world to hop into our avatar and to have meetings or you know collaborations, learning sessions, or just to socialize. So. Um, and uh, you guys, all of you guys have been scanned, um, which means um, a, a body scan was performed. So um, your digital twin of yourself was created. And uh, another way to create an avatar would be um, you sent us selfies and choose a generic body. And um, then you got an avatar as well. So um, yeah, and uh, welcome, welcome to the space, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vladimir. And by the way, we are uh, videotaped by um, uh, your colleague, Sasha. Uh, and uh, so welcome, Sasha, as well. And thank you for um, videotaping us. So let's right away continue with our discussion. So previously, we have been more um, focusing on the psychological effect of failure uh, for individuals, for organizations. Now, what I would like to focus on with you guys is on how a virtual um, world, the virtual environment, virtual reality can contribute to minimize, to reduce cost. And Kurosh, I remember that you have mentioned, for example, that uh, also with your adhesives you are uh, providing and supplying to uh, the OEM automotive producers, that this is also a good opportunity to minimize cost of failure. C can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, absolutely, Sasha, um, um, Paco. So you take uh, this situation right now. We are here with our digital twins, right? Mm -hmm. And exactly this is what uh, we are practicing with the automotive industry now quite some time. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Finite Element Analysis, FEA. So we're basically we simulate with a computerized way our adhesives performance in a car and make sure, for instance, that the structural bonds that we have in the car are um, in real uh, world uh, scenarios simulated with crash. So nowadays, different than perhaps 10 years back where you crashed a lot of cars to get uh, clarity about the performance of your adhesives, as an example, Nowadays, you're doing all these uh, failure trials and to get the insights in a simulation uh, with uh, FEA models, and you get then the um, last, let's say, few um, crashes you do in real life to confirm actually what you did. So with this, you can maximize your return on failure by minimizing uh, the costs because you can imagine doing this uh, with your digital twin doesn't cost a lot. Mm. To, uh, do you have an idea how much this reduces the whole um, innovation cycle of bringing a new car uh, onto the market? Well, it's substantial. Uh, you know, as it was gradually growing uh, in the uh, last couple of years, so last 10 years, you can even say, it has... Uh, uh, accelerated by several uh, X, uh, the innovation process. I can talk uh, also about our uh, own situation. You take uh, our uh, cycles of iteration. So before you really had to do Q1 
chemistry put together sim uh, and then uh, you know test things now we can mm. do this uh, several thousand test runs within a few hours uh, in a simulated way so mm. that's a, a very powerful way to reduce let's say the costs so the uh, if you think of a return on investment calculation this is the uh, uh, denominator but actually the interesting part is also how can you maximize the outcome to maximize your return on failure and this is you get all the data digitally so you can much mm. better process the information the insights and as i mentioned earlier I, in the end, I want to bring this to not only thousand salespeople the insights, but to a couple of hundred thousands customers, so that they can get the benefits of Loctite. Very interesting. Thank you, um, um, Kurosh. So coming now to you, uh, Anke, and your uh, let's say uh, university hospital uh, environment. Uh, what are some of the possible? Um, applications of VR and also AI to, to your medical world? Well, when it comes to health, um, with the numerous, the abundance of health data sets, you know, that we can actually work with, um, we dream of actually um, well, offering the personalized precision medicine that technically we could offer. And um, not only AI, virtual reality is also a very strong you know, part of that. For instance, at the moment, we are already using virtual reality for education purposes. Uh, we've got uh, an, an own, well, designer for, uh, in, in the university hospital that uh, she designs, you know, virtual rea reality scenarios because we have of um, digitized uh, laboratories and uh, also patient rooms, you know. So that is definitely something that we look into in different scenarios. Also with gaming, you know, when you when you actually ask children, for instance, to have an MRI scan, you must very often do that in um, general anesthesia because children get very afraid and very scared. And if one of you has ever experienced an MRI scan, mm. you probably know that it's very noisy yeah. and you have to lie absolutely still. So we use virtual reality gaming for the children to learn, you know, that this noise is nothing that they have to be scared of, but there's no harm, there's no pain, etc. So there are whole different ways and scenarios where VR is being used uh, also in, in the theater with uh, augmented reality and mixed real reality, like for instance, in our smart operating um, theaters. So I could re really give you a whole set of examples and um, well, the same applies to artificial intelligence, algorithms, machine learning processes. So for diagnostics, for instance, you know, we have developed um, a number of uh, AI of, uh, use cases that actually work out very well where we have sufficient data sets, like for instance, in radiology, uh, because uh, AI algorithms are never tired, you know, they are very quick in analyzing. And uh, as long as there is a doctor that can actually, um, well, work with the results of the analyses, uh, then, you know, that's fine. It's just another technical improval of diagnoses. Mm. Uh, what I found really fascinating in your, uh, in your answer, Anke, was that, you know, I mean, we, the people who are normally not so familiar with AI and VR, we're probably a little bit afraid of dehumanizing, uh, let's say, our society and the business. But what you just described with uh, the, the children and how they are helped through this, it's the contrary even. I, I don't say that it's not controversy anymore, but at least, you know, it gives us also a lot of opportunities to humanize business or medicine. Um, so that, that's very, let's say, uh, promising and encouraging. Vladimir, from your work with, uh, with clients, but also with your team, uh, virtual uh, reality, uh, can you give us one or two examples 
where this has provided the most value. Um, I remember that you described once that you're working with a university in California where they have built, you know, the pyramids and then with the students, the professor went through the pyramids and experienced the real feeling. Um, yes, uh, sure, Paco. Uh, so uh, there are there are different use cases. Uh, maybe just to underline what what Anke said um, that um, you know uh, different studies have shown if you you know enable a, a patient to to see, for example, where a tumor in your body is placed, and you can you can see it in three dimensions in your body, uh, that it really helps. Uh, for you as a patient to understand treatment, to understand mm. procedure and where you're going through. So this will enable us, uh, Paco, to, to, to understand and better collaborate with, with doctors and nurses. Um, and back to your question, uh, one example is coming out of the Magenta family. Uh, this is a Magenta space. So, uh, for example, we are we are building a, a Magenta metaverse uh, for a client, uh, Deutsche Telekom. And um, when we started uh, with T Systems, uh, which is a daughter company, um, they had to issue because of COVID. You know, clients uh, couldn't visit their innovation centers around the globe. And one innovation center is located in Munich. And what we did actually, we we, we generated a digital twin of the innovation center with uh, different uh, use cases and showcases in there, uh, with possibilities of using all media formats you're using in the in the real world. And um, you know, uh, they performed since then 240 workshops, uh, international workshops, um, and um, very successful, and got a great conversion rate, uh, which means conversion rate in, you know, generating revenue out of avatar workshops. And, um, you know, they are planning to, to, to have this established, even if, you know, COVID and um, social distancing is uh, not uh, practice anymore. So they would like to stay in a hybrid format to enable international, you know, clients to visit them as avatars, but also, you know, colleagues from around the world, for example, you know, innovators from, from Los Angeles or from Spain to introduce uh, clients who are physically in Munich or in another innovation center, um, you know, to enable them to, to, to visit showcases and use cases from around the world in the same time. Mm. Excellent. And I'm looking at Kurosh because I know that Henkel has uh, inaugurated a client experienced center at the HQ in Düsseldorf. Uh, so, I mean, as we all know, client experience journeys are so key to success these days. Could this also be an uh, um, opportunity, an option for you and Henkel, uh, Kurosh? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, indeed, we have that. Uh, so we have a so-called infinity room where you pretty much exactly do that. And uh, the high, the the um, real world with the digital world becomes a hybrid. So uh, you have augmented reality opportunities there, virtual reality. And I, I, I would elaborate on one dimension in this context that I believe is very important this um, opportunity to be in a situation like we go into a uh, engine of a car and we look jointly with our customer into the engine, into the di digital twin as an example, but also in a learning situation like we do uh, with your company, Hemsley Fraser, um, uh, Paco. I think the important piece is you can accelerate what was always in my career the biggest challenge, if you want to do a real transformation, you need that the individual has a mindset uh, uh, mindset shift, has this, mm. uh, you know, learning experience that they start themselves, say, ah, okay, now I got it. And we use a lot of coaching to get to that. But I believe this virtual reality will help us big time that the individual can feel more what is actually the target picture looking like of the transformation uh, that we are actually aspiring to. How would it feel for me? 
like I put myself again in the shoes of my salesperson, that the salesperson can actually be already in that future state, simulate this uh, mm. customer uh, exchange, say how he is uh, or she is capable to better sell the expertise, to demonstrate the value of our offering, and then see also the feedback of the customers, right? Mm. I think this will be a massive accelerator of us being capable to transform our organizations and convince our individuals and then train them. Mm. May I um, add something to that? Please, Anke. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when it comes to customer um, customers in medicine, we have to look at our patients. And whereas I think, you know, that a VR, AR, mixed reality approach, you know, is, is very important for different scenarios. Uh, in medicine, you always have to look at all of the patients. So if, um, it might be, you know, that when it comes to those sort of scenarios where you can try out different things, uh, it works very well for, well, children and probably, uh, I'd say, like middle-aged people. Um, but maybe, you know, for the older patients, that is not going to be a, a good scenario. But uh, on the other hand, you know, as Koros also pointed out, you know, um, uh, it's not only from from the customer side and for us for the patient side, but extremely valuable for us inside the organization, you know, where it comes to innovative ideas, working together, creating also, um, well, a, a hybrid or digital workspace that can actually unite us internationally and bring scientists and other people together and work, you know, in, in this defined scenario where you normally in reality, um, you must come together and you must sit together, you know, and, and exchange ideas. I think, you know, the virtual world can actually offer this sort of secluded space, which is far better than um, a video conferencing system. Mm. So, uh, I mean, you depict uh, a lot of uh, opportunities and future options to improve things, not only in the business world, but also in uh, for us as patients uh, in, in a hospital. So let me ask you a, a final round, one, one last question to each of you. Um, so we have experienced now two years of uh, pandemic. Uh, we have been used to much more um, home office environment. So we are uh, for those who have not been experienced this, you know, video conferencing before. So what, what is, from your point of view, in your personal business environment, what can be the positive effects of this, let's say, pandemic experience connected to the opportunities in VR, but also with AI? Um, anyone who would like to start in replying to that last question? Uh, yeah, maybe, um, you know, uh, COVID uh, for Dupe uh, was a total accelerator. So, which means it, it really uh, multiplicated uh, and fastened up processes with which without COVID would uh, have been taken longer. Mm. Um, what we also saw or see right now are effects like, you know, uh, giant tech companies like Facebook, who called itself Meta, um, uh, Apple, and 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 the big players, especially Microsoft, are now hopping into the metaverse. And this is something we predicted already in 2014. That's why we we, we followed our vision to to you know to democratize avatarization for all humans because we believe you know the simulated world in the metaverse and our real world they will connect one day and um uh, this connection is, is is really which is kind of showing uh, covid showed us a, a little bit how a, a trip towards this you know combination of worlds of realities uh, will look like thank you uh, vladimir anke would you like to continue Yes, sure. I mean, for the pandemic was also for, for medicine, you know, very important when it comes to digitalization because 
classic leave. Um, we lagged behind. We were we were far behind, you know, industry. And AI, of course, you can only well develop if you've got enough uh, data sets and health data sets. So it was also an accelerator when it comes to that, and it had to uh, well also work in the sense that many patients couldn't come to us anymore. And um, we had to open up new ways of incorporating them into our ecosystem. But uh, so, uh, yeah, um, uh, I think it's it's really important, um, but we are still behind, you know, when it comes to the comparison to industry. Thank you, Anke. Kurosh, would you like to also share your point of view? Yes. So COVID was actually a booster for our growth. And let me start uh, in multiple dimensions. Actually, it was a booster for our growth. It was a booster for the individual, for the organization and the uh, understanding the VUCA world is real, is here, mm. is already experiencing. And so we need to change our leadership. We need the collective wisdom of the organization. Every single person has to contribute. Uh, because there is not a single person knowing everything in this VUCA world. But it boosted also our growth in our business in the core by digitalizing a lot of things, using much more data, everybody being much more eased to use things like Teams here. And then it boosted the everything beyond the core. So because before it was difficult to imagine that our adhesives one day would be uh, connected with software with equipment with iot and this has become a reality already where we have in the meantime with loctite pulse even customer projects so i think it was exactly what we all felt it was an accelerator of everything and that we are doing uh, this uh, session here real Digital, but also real digital as avatars in a metaverse is, I think, a perfect proof point for that. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. So if I may summarize it in a few words, um, with regards to approach to fail or failure, uh, I think we all agreed that uh, if, let's say, taken it in a professional way, Failure is something positive where we can learn a lot from, where we should see more the opportunities this offers. And also with regards to, let's say, the second part of our session today, uh, virtual reality, a um, little bit uh, intermingled with AI as well, offers also, if correctly used, if used in a responsible manner, so many opportunities also to humanize not only business, but also our uh, healthcare. So uh, I think um, it's a, a pretty positive outlook we are confronted with. So I would like to thank you for your contributions today. Anke Vladimir Kurosh, it was a pleasure and I hope you have uh, a great uh, year 2022.